It's a little scary being in front of this many people, <laughs> um, especially since I spent a large part of the last year alone in this boat talking to a plastic pink flamingo. <laughs> um, this is him. His name's Frank. You guys say hi to Frank. Wow. It took me two months before I was talking to Plastic Fleet Flamingos. You guys are way, way ahead of me. <laughs> so I met Frank in the middle of a 4,000-mile kayaking trip from the northern point, the northernmost point of the lower 48 uh, to Key West, Florida, the southernmost point. And probably the best place to begin this story is on a dock in northern Minnesota four days into the trip. I paddled up. I wanted to rest for a minute, and there was a woman sitting there fishing, and she saw me. She looked at the boat. She looked at me. She looked at the gear strapped to the deck. Eventually, she got curious enough. She walked over and said, hey, how long have you been out in that thing? And I looked up. I said, oh, I've been out four days. And she said, oh, well, where are you going? And I said, well, I'm going to Key West. <laughs> She thought about it for a minute. She kind of digested it. Her face really didn't give away much, you know. And she looked at me and says, what's the, what's the longest you've ever been out in one of those things? I said, four days. <laughs> 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 See, people, they think you're crazy when you start talking about kayaking from basically the Canadian border to Key West. I mean, this is... This is the kind of things they say. They say, have you ever heard of an airplane? Have you heard of cars? <laughs> how, about, how about a motorcycle, like even a scooter? You know, take a scooter, trains, buses, anything. This is why we invented the wheel. Why are you in a kayak? <laughs> but I like it slow. <laughs> I like it really slow. Um, the world's different when you take it slow. It moves at a different pace. You're disconnected at 30,000 feet. All you see, maybe a Sky Mall magazine, some overhead bends, that's it. And even in a car, even in a car, the world gets distorted at that kind of speed. For example, have you guys ever driven on the interstate? You know those dotted lines in the middle of the road? How long do you think those lines are? Do you think they're a foot long? Two feet? Three? Try 10 feet long. And if you don't believe me, look it up, look it up. You can win a bet with your friends, buy a drink or something. They're, t <laughs> they're, ten, they're 10 feet long. But on a kayak, it's slow. You're connected to the journey. In a plane, you leave Minnesota, you arrive in Key West, five hours later, maybe, maybe 10 if you have to stop in Atlanta. <laughs> um, <laughs> you don't see anything. You leave the world of down jackets and people complaining about how cold it is. And then you arrive, and you're wearing shorts, drinking a margarita, and it's basically like teleportation, slowly, slowly. Um, but in a kayak, it's different. You see, you see the Canadian Shield's granite rocks change into Mississippi mud. You see the Mississippi mud change into Louisiana marsh. You see Louisiana marsh change into Florida sand. You understand how those two places are connected. It's an incredible journey. But it's impossible, right? You can't kayak from Minnesota to Key West. So I don't, I don't really blame that woman on the dock for thinking I was crazy. I'm going to show you guys a little bit of a map here. Oh, let's see how, how far it goes. Oh, another fold. There's another fold. Oh, we're almost there. We're almost there. Okay. This is the route from, Key, or from Minnesota to Key West. This right here, is how far I'd gone in four days. <laughs> now, a lot of people look at this, and they focus on this big part down here. 
It's a really big part. But the important part, the part that really matters, is right here, these two inches. That's what really matters. And that's what this woman didn't quite understand. So I want to talk to you a little bit about breaking down impossible ideas into possible pieces. When I started this trip, I looked for someone else who had done something similar. So maybe I could follow their path, I could figure it out. I couldn't find anybody. So then I thought, well, I'll start at the top and work my way down. So I wanted to find the northernmost point. And a lot of people think it's in Maine. I thought it was in Maine. It's not. It's in Minnesota. And it's an accident of history that goes all the way back to the Founding Fathers and the Revolutionary War. So we sent our found, like a, a team to France. We're going to negotiate with England. And uh, they came up with this treaty. And this is what it, what it read. It basically said, we're going to go to the Lake of the Woods and then a bunch of gibberish. But basically, Lake of the Woods west to the Mississippi River. And this is the map they were working with. Back then, you can see here, I'm going to get a little assist from my kayak paddle in here. I'll point it out. Oof. This is Lake of the Woods right up here. This is the Mississippi River. This is an insert of Hudson Bay. So but the Mississippi just looks like it's going to keep going up there. And that little note there actually told them, yeah, it goes all the way up there. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, sadly for our founding fathers, the Mississippi ends about in here. <laughs> and this is the Lake of the Woods. So, you know, when someone tells you the founding fathers were flawless, not quite. <laughs> they, only, they only misplaced the biggest river in North America. You know, no big deal. So you can make mistakes in your life. Don't feel too bad about them. <laughs> um, that caused a little bit of tension with Canada or then England and, you know, eventually a little awkwardness. There were some more treaties. They worked it out. And boom, Minnesota has a chimney now <laughs> that happens happens to be the northernmost point in the United States. <laughs> so, I got the northernmost point. Now I need the southernmost point. Now, the southernmost point's easy, because anyone who's ever been to Key West has a picture with the southernmost point, right? <laughs> you know, it looks just like this. It's this monument. And uh, unfortunately, it's not really the southernmost point. It's the actual southernmost point is on a little island about 10 miles west and a little bit south. But uh, there might be a guy wearing boxer shorts with a rifle guarding it. It's a privately owned island. Um, so I still highly recommend this monument if you ever want a picture of the southernmost point. It's, a, it's an awkward conversation with that guy. <laughs> I will just leave it at that. <laughs> so we got the... Uh, we got the southernmost point, we got the northernmost point. What about in between? And um, basically, I looked at a map and I said, all right, there's all these blue lines, so you gotta connect them somewhere. I, I just like, connected a few up there, I got to Lake Superior, and then I was like, all right, I gotta get to the Mississippi River, I'll, I'll connect a few over, and I'm at the Mississippi River, and then it's like, easy, easy, because I can just like pretend I'm Huckleberry Finn, I'll just float down. <laughs> Um, when we hit the ocean, just take a left. That's it. Like, we're there. <laughs> this is so simple. Why has no one ever done this? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. It's not actually that easy. <laughs> um, it's not that easy, but the important thing is that I was taking the first steps. I, 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 I had this giant big idea, but, but all I really needed to focus on were the first small pieces of it. That little, that little two inches of Lake of the Woods, it was the first piece, and I'd stack it on top of the next piece, and I'd stack the next piece on top of them. And 
as I'd go along, you know, I figured I could fill in the details. As I went, you know, I'd, I'd ask people along the route. I'd say, hey, you know, how about that, that river over there? Is that, can I paddle that? Or how about that lake? And uh, they'd tell me, oh, yeah, you can, go, get a, you can connect over here or whatever. One lady was even like, well, why don't you just skip all this? You just go out the Great Lakes, go to New York, just go down the East Coast. I'm <laughs> like, you're a crazy lady. Um, I, I'm going to stick with the Mississippi. I want to be Huck Finn, right? Um, so, <laughs> so anyway, you go as, as you go along, you, you fill out the details. And I don't want you to get, get stopped on the, the idea to start. All you need is a tiny little piece of this impossible link, this impossible map to start on. And you just go. You fill out the next most important piece as you go forward. Of course, I had one, one other little problem I haven't really mentioned and that's that I'd never, ever sea kayaked before in my life. <laughs> it's a little, little, little issue. Um, I'm not saying I'd never kayaked before. I'd done a little bit of white water about 10 years before. And I'd like messed around in those little sit-on-top kayaks they have at resorts in Florida. Um, <laughs> not quite a sea kayak fully loaded with 80 pounds of gear. A wave threw me into a rock on the first day out. And I had to immediately, I I jumped out of the boat, I crawled over to this island, I'm dragging the boat behind me, I'm just like, holy, holy moly, I just crashed this boat on day one. Um, (laughs) What what is going on? Um, I dragged out all my gear to dry it out. I was soaking wet. It's cold in Minnesota, even in June. It's like Florida's winter. Um, yeah, it wasn't a good day. And if you had been on that dock a couple of days later, if you were an odds maker or a betting man, you'd probably put my odds of making it to Key West pretty low, right? I don't, I don't think a lot of you would bet on me. But again... I wasn't trying to paddle to Key West. All I was trying to do is go a couple more miles down the Rainy River, just a couple more. And then the next day, I was going to wake up, and I was going to go a little further, a little further down the Rainy River. And the odds, they start to look a little better, you know, when you think of that, right? I think even some of you might, might start betting on me then. And if I said, well, what are my odds of making it around the next bend in the river? I think a lot of you would start betting on me. So by breaking impossible things down into smaller pieces, you switch yourself. You switch yourself from being an overwhelming underdog to an overwhelming favorite. And that's important because it changes your mentality. You feel like you're going to win. This is easy. You will succeed because it's so easy. It's It's just 20 feet down the river. Like, how can I not make it there? And so it just changes your entire mindset from one of fear to one to one of of confidence and knowing that you're going to succeed. So, how many of you guys have ever heard of portaging? (laughs) It's not pleasant, especially with a 17-foot kayak. (laughs) Connecting those blue lines on the map didn't go quite as I planned. They, uh, They came close, but you still have to travel between them. And a portage is basically when you have to carry a boat between two pieces of navigable water. You got a lake over there, you got a lake over here. I got to get this boat over there. So, you know, you start dragging it around. Then you hit like a giant rock. You got to pick it up. This is a heavy boat. It's 65 pounds, empty. It's 17 feet long. And then you got another 80 pounds of gear. So it's a little, it's a lot. (laughs) <laughs> the last portage of the trip was called the Savannah Portage, and it connected Lake Superior to the Mississippi River. Um, a lot of these were old fur trading routes, and this is what they said about the Savannah Portage in an old journal. It is generally considered the worst carrying place in the Northwest, and judging from the great number of canoes <laughs> which lie decaying along it, <laughs> having, never, having been abandoned in, co- in consequence of the difficulty experienced in getting over, its reputation is well-deserved. 
That was 150 years ago <laughs> when the Savannah Portage was well used, well maintained. It was a major artery of commerce for the fur trade. Now, <laughs> it's lucky if it gets one person a year. <laughs> and I was that lucky person. <laughs> It's about five miles of trail and three miles of swamp. But the days were filled with small victories. Every log that I pulled it over, every beaver dam that I dragged it across, every mud flat that I walked through, every piece of swamp that I sunk into my hip, that was a victory. That was the piece I was focused on. And when you break things like this into small pieces, it allows you to live in the moment, to have total focus on that challenge and that challenge alone. And when you succeed, it brings you joy. And, that's, and that joy will fuel you into the next challenge. So you end up with a chain reaction of success and joy, challenge after challenge. And it can make three days struggling over five miles of trail and three miles of swamp into one of the best experiences of a whole trip because it felt filled with challenges and filled with the joy of success. And that's what I did on the whole trip. I celebrated crossing state lines, crossing a lake, getting to an island. I celebrated every little piece as much as I could so that each success would fuel the next. And if you do it right, if you break it down, you'll have just a total focus in the moment. The end, Key West, the end of whatever goal you have, can never fuel you. It's not enough. It's too far away. On this trip, I failed to kayak to Key West every single day except for the last one. <laughs> you got to succeed and survive on the small victories one at a time. So there I was on that dock four days into the trip, knowing I'd moved all of two inches on the map. Knowing that those two inches is what really mattered. Those first pieces stacked together. They built on each other, and I knew that they would keep building piece by piece as I went along. So what you guys have to do is you have to ask yourself, what dreams do you have? What things have you put off because you think they're impossible? Did you want to open a business or be a doctor? Do you want to learn how to dance? Do you want to be the best teacher a child ever had? What is it? What is it? Learn how to cook. Learn how to sing. What do you want to do? And then take that and find that first little piece. Find that first piece and take it on. Break it off. Start, because you won't have all the answers when you start. You need that first piece. You start there, and you keep going. Act on it. Do something. And then, when you have that piece, you'll flip the odds. The odds will be in your favor. You will succeed, because it's inevitable. That piece is so small, it's so easy. <laughs> Write that first line of the novel. Learn the first steps of a dance. And then focus on it. Focus on that first piece. Put all your focus on there. Forget the rest and focus on that piece. And if you do, if you break that piece off and start moving, I promise you that all your dreams are reachable. And you'll realize you can dream even bigger than you ever thought possible. I got to Key West <laughs> nine months after I left that dock. <laughs> I don't think I dreamt big enough. Two days later, I decided to paddle back along the Atlantic. I started the next morning. Frank came with me. <laughs> Thank you.